This is next in the series, uh, taking us through the book of Revelation. And we've got to chapter 14, verse 14. So I'll begin by uh, reading that passage. Uh, 14, 14. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed out of the press rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. I saw in heaven another great and marvellous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image, and over the number of its name. And they held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. So there are times in Revelation when we're not totally sure of the precise timing of the particular vision that we're looking at. Is it past? Is it present? Or indeed, is it future? Or is it a combination of, of all three? Well, at the end of chapter 14, there is no real doubt. This is the end of the age. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 13, which is very similar in content to what is described here. He likened the kingdom of God to a man sowing uh, a good seed in a field. But before it sprouts, while everyone is asleep, an enemy sows weeds in the field and the two sprout and grow together. And a servant asked the owner who did this. And the owner explains it was an enemy. Well, they ask, should we pull up the weeds before harvesting? And the owner tells them not to, but to wait until harvest time. At that time, both will be harvested together. Where and then the weeds separated and burnt. And later his disciples asked Jesus to explain the parable. So let's read what uh, Jesus said. Notice the similarities between the parable interpretation and what we've just read in uh, Revelation. So Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, they'll weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So in both these uh, passages, the one in Revelation and this uh, interpretation of the parable, uh, we have uh, these similarities. In both, the Son of Man is mentioned. In both, there is obviously a harvest. 
In both, there is the enemy, the devil, who has been at work in the world. And in both, the world contains either those who are sons or people of the kingdom or those who are sons or people of the devil, just as we've had described in the last few passages of Revelation. And in both passages, the harvesters are angels. And the punishment of those who are the people of the evil one is horrendous in both of these passages. The reward for the people of the kingdom is glorious. So the passage in Revelation seems to fit with this parable uh, very well. There are obvious similarities, but it's not necessarily a straightforward uh, retelling. There appear to be two harvests in this passage in Revelation. Is one the wheat and the other the weeds? Well, some have certainly suggested that, and that is a possible interpretation. Certainly the second description seems to be the harvest of those who are ripe for God's wrath, the weeds, if you like. But the first harvest doesn't specifically say that this is the harvest of the, the righteous. Now, I may be wrong, but I think that what is seen in this passage is first a depiction of the general harvest at the end of the age of both the people of the kingdom and the people of the evil one. And then the second harvest depicts the same event, but focuses on the harvest of the people of the evil one. So in the first harvest, uh, we have a description of the man who's seated on a white cloud, looking like the son of man. Well, some have said that this is an angel, but it's surely much more likely that this is Jesus. Uh, the same designation, one like a son of man, is used of the glorious vision of Jesus that John uh, records in uh, chapter one. And in chapter one, we're told that Jesus will come with the clouds. And here, of course, he's seated on a cloud. And this is surely there for a depiction of his return to earth. He's royally crowned and he holds the instrument of harvest, a sharp sickle. Incidentally, the word sickle is mentioned uh, seven times in this passage, underlining uh, the unity of the section and the theme of one complete harvest. And an angel comes from the temple, the presence of God, and announces that the harvest of the earth is ripe. And of course, Jesus said that no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. It's Mark 13, 32. And this is the point in time when the hour has come. It is Jesus coming on the clouds that signals that the harvest and the judgment is about to occur. And at his coming, there is a separation. Those who have lived side by side on earth will at that stage be separated, the wheat and the weeds. And Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 28, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. The second description of the harvest, which is almost a word for word repetition of the first, focuses on the harvest of those who've done evil. They're depicted as clusters of grape, grapes who are, are ripe for harvest, ready to be thrown into the winepress of God's wrath. And God's wrath has already been referred to uh, earlier in chapter 14 as a cup of wine. And here that image is brought into sharp focus so that later in chapter 19, we'll read that there is a rider on a white horse, Jesus, who treads the winepress of God's wrath. And that this graphic detail given in this last verse here, verse 20, uh, is, is horrendous in its description. 
uh, the suffering of those who followed the beast is similar to, to what we read uh, earlier in the chapter. There, they're tor tormented with burning sulfur, and here their blood spreads out uh, a great symbolic distance, 1,600 stadia, and there's so much of it that it reaches to the height uh, of a horse bridle. And these descriptions are not for the squeamish. And, and even if they are symbolic, they're meant to underline the serious consequences of rebellion against God. They're meant to jolt us, to make us sit up and take note. God is not to be trifled with. The final judgment is to be taken with deadly seriousness. So the end of the age has arrived in this vision at the end of chapter 14. Uh, but as has happened previously in the book, we are taken to the brink of the end, but we're not yet taken to the final denouement. A similar thing happened with the seven seals. When the sixth seal was opened, we seem to have arrived at the end of the age. Uh, the wrath of the Lamb had come, we read. But instead of a revelation of the new heaven and the new earth, seven more plagues were revealed that the seven trumpets. And they appeared to be warning judgments to those on earth to repent. And again, we reach the seventh and the last trumpet. And it's again signified the return of Christ. This time for judging of the dead, uh, all the time was announced for judging the dead. But again, we were taken no further, taken to the brink, but not quite to the final end. In fact, the, the clock seemed to be completely turned back when we got to chapter 12, where John saw the woman and the dragon, and we were taken to the birth and the ascension of Christ. War in heaven and Satan's downfall was revealed and the devil's schemes in the world were then uh, revealed in, into chapter 13. His control over world powers that are and will be anti-God, his control over false religions and prophets that will lead people astray, his instigation of uh, extreme opposition against the saints, against God's people. And now at the end of this sequence, the end is again revealed at the end of chapter 14, this time as the harvest of the earth. And we might expect at the beginning of chapter 15 to see revealed the new heaven and the new earth. But that is again postponed. There are still, we read, seven more plagues to come, albeit we're assured seven last plagues. And with them, God's wrath is completed. So before the end of the age can be fully described, there is more to be revealed. These seven last plagues, which seem to take us back again to the period before the harvest of the earth, before Christ returns. And we have to ask ourselves, are these last in the sense that they are, there are no more to be described? We've, we've had the seals, we've had the trumpets, and now lastly, the plagues without really telling us anything about the timing? Or are these last because they come in a period immediately preceding Christ's return? These are the final plagues in time. Well, I'm going to postpone answering that question until uh, next time. Because before the terrible wrath of God through these seven plagues is revealed in detail, John has revealed to him a marvellous tableau which appears to make no reference in fact to the wrath to come it, it's another oasis in the desert of judgment and wrath just like the vision that John had at the beginning of chapter 14 that the 144,000 with the lamb on Mount Zion just as that vision was in sharp contrast to what had preceded it so is this the readers of Revelation, of the vi vision of Revelation, must never be allowed to lose sight of the glorious position of those who are victorious over the beast. And just as the first part of chapter 14 is an encouragement to believers to keep themselves pure, 
to not forsake God, but to devote themselves to him. So this vision is an encouragement not to bow the knee to the beast, but to be counted amongst those who are victorious. So what exactly does John see? Well, he sees in heaven, verse one, a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, the victorious ones. John says that they had been victorious over the beast, his image and the number of his name. And that word victorious sends us back to uh, the beginning of Revelation, to the seven letters. At the end of each letter, those who are victorious are promised future blessing eating of the tree of life, protection from the second death, the hidden manner, authority over the nations, white garments to wear, the honour of becoming a pillar in the temple of God, and finally the privilege of sitting with Christ on his throne. And we met this word victorious uh, last in chapter 12. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. They were victorious over him by the blood of the lamb. Believers have victory over Satan by the blood of the lamb. And these are the same ones we saw standing on Mount Zion singing a new song. So it's little wonder that they break out in exultant song, a song of victory. Though the beast appeared to be the victorious one, and we read that in chapter 13, verse 7, it turns out that those he opposed are truly the victorious ones. And the victors stand beside what seems to be a sea of glass mixed with fire. And this is probably the same sea that was seen in chapter 4, which is before the throne of God. It seems appropriate to see them standing victorious beside a sea because the children of Israel escaped from Pharaoh by crossing the impenetrable barrier of the Red Sea. So these have escaped from Satan's grasp and now stand on the farther shore in absolute safety. And they're given harps by God and they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And when the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea, they stood beside it and sang the song of Moses, the song of victory, the song of triumph over Pharaoh, Pharaoh and their enemies, and the song of liberation. It's recorded for us in Exodus 15. And that song of victory in Exodus 15 foreshadowed this song of victory here in Revelation. Then it celebrated the victory over Pharaoh and his army of the escape out of bondage in Egypt. Here they celebrate victory over Satan and the beast of escape from Babylon, the great city who we'll read of more in the next few chapters. Of escape from bondage to sin and death, of redemption by the Lamb. So yet again, we see that it is the business of those who are in heaven to sing the praises of God. And Revelation repeatedly teaches us that our destiny is the new heaven and the new earth, and there we will be singing the song of the Lamb. So this song, what is it? Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. And the magnificence of God's works are first evoked. They are great and wonderful, his works of creation, and supremely his work of redemption. Revelation is the only book in the New Testament to use this phrase, Lord God Almighty. We get it seven times in the book. This is the third occasion. And it's used of God by the Greek translators of the Old Testament to translate the Hebrew phrase, Lord of hosts, or uh, Lord of the armies uh, of heaven, Yahweh Sebaoth, is therefore echoes Moses' song where he praises God, saying, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. That's Exodus 15, 3. And God as warrior will come into full vision in chapter 19. In fact, this is really foreshadowing 
what we read in chapter 19, where we see the rider on the white horse. And not only are his deeds great and marvellous, his character is impeccable, just, or righteous, and true are his ways. He is also king of the nations or king of the ages. Some, some manuscripts have got nations, the NIV 2011 uh, uses that translation. Other manuscripts have ages, the NLV uh, 1984 uses that word. Uh, either might be correct. Uh, both are found elsewhere in scripture. Jeremiah 10, 7 and 1 Timothy 1, 17 uses either of those phrases. And he's perfect in his judgment and actions over all the nations and through all eternity. And in Moses' final song, recorded in Deuteronomy 32, uh, at the end of his life, he says or sings this. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Just as he was then when Moses sang that song, so he is today and so he will be tomorrow. We live in a, a world full of sin. Motivations and judgments are so often warped and tainted. And we perhaps find it hard to envisage such a perfection. But the God who we worship is perfect in all his ways. And the next stanza of the song poses this rhetorical question. Who will not fear and glorify your name? And notice the way the question is posed. It's assumed that all will fear and glorify the Lord's name and ask who will not fear his name, expecting the answer that no one will uh, do this. Many had feared the beast and glorified the name of the beast. But in the end, all will fear and glorify the Lord's name. And then we get these three, four statements that are advanced to make this claim uh, emphatic. Firstly, for you alone are holy. I remember uh, the cry of the four living creatures back in chapter four, holy, holy, holy. God is intrinsically holy, is set apart from his creation in his purity and perfection. And this alone should call all to glorify his name. And secondly, for all nations will come and worship or fall down before you. One day, every knee will bow the knee. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. At the moment, the nations are in rebellion against God, but one day they will fear him and glorify his name. And this also is reason for us to glorify his name today. And thirdly, for your righteous acts have been made manifest. On that day, it will be made clear to everyone what is clear to us as believers already, that God's judgments are and will be perfect. Everyone will acknowledge that what he says and decrees is just and true. Cause again to glorify his name. So this is the song of victory, the song of the Lamb. And as with all the other songs in Revelation, we can take up its theme now, declaring God's great and marvellous deeds, his righteous and true ways. And we bow the knee, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord, and remembering that the day is coming when the final harvest takes place and everyone will bow the knee. Let's pray together. Lord God Almighty, we join with the song of the Lamb and declare that you are just and true King of the nations. We look forward to that day when we too will stand before you, victorious ones, when the final harvest is reaped as Jesus returns to the earth. Help us to remain faithful to Jesus, to keep his commands, to triumph over Satan through the blood of the Lamb, to worship you as 
king of the nations. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.